Genesis chapter 22 on page 19. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for his Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld me from me, your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcah is also a mother. She has borne sons to your brother Nahor. Uz, the firstborn, Uz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Abraham, Kesed, Pezo, Hildash, Jidlap, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. Milcah bore these eight sons to Abraham's brother Nahor, whose concubine, whose name was Reuma, had also had sons, Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Makah. Thank you for that, Jasmine. Uh, there's actually a special unit at Bible College just for pronouncing names in the Bible. Um, just kidding. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I was just thinking after George's testimony, uh, he felt maybe that it was a bit short, that he didn't have much to say, but I detected at least two encouragements for two different types of people from George's testimony. And the first one was an encouragement to parents. Uh, how many of you parents uh, are worried that you are getting it wrong? Uh, I'm not a parent myself, but my belief just through uh, many years of spending time with you and uh, parents, um, that there is a big button. There's a hidden button, but there's a big button that every parent has that says, I'm doing something wrong and I'm permanently um, damaging my children. And then whenever, whenever someone sort of says something that makes you think, oh, maybe that secret fear is real, uh, that, 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 that can be quite hurtful, that can hurt. 
What I heard today is about a dad who didn't get it all right, who preached the law but perhaps didn't preach the gospel, and yet God still saved George. It's an encouragement to parents that, you, that one, you're not going to get it right all the time. You're not always going to get it right. And even if you don't get it right, God's grace is what saves, not us getting it everything right as a parent. The second thing I heard was an encouragement to those who grew up in Christian households. I mean, how many are here, grown up in a Christian household, and can't pinpoint the time when you became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? You're just like, I, I don't remember a specific point. I just remember always believing. And for that person, there can be a little bit of a worry that maybe I haven't had a genuine conversion experience because I don't remember that specific point of going from death to life. Well, it's an encouragement to us that not everybody has that experience. What we want for our children is for them to not have exciting testimonies. Right? The exciting testimony of, of a life of sin and drug dealing and then becoming Christian. It's exciting in the sense that all of us, if we were Christians, have gone from death to life. Uh, that a miracle has occurred if we put our trust in Jesus. But I think it's an encouragement to those who grew up in Christian households that God has saved them, even if they can't remember exactly when that happened. So thank you, George, uh, for sharing that. I think there was something in that for at least a couple of different people and something, in fact, for all of us to be encouraged. Uh, I come to uh, this morning's message that I have called Trust the Plan and Obey the Lord. Trust the Plan and Obey the Lord. We're coming to the end of our Trust the Plan series. I'd originally intended to go up to chapter 36 and complete the, um, the Patriarchs. I think we're going to take a break. Um, and after, in a few weeks' time, we'll go to our Got Questions series. More information will come out in the email about how to submit questions for the Got Questions series. Um, but this is our second to last sermon in this series. Uh, I'll do one final one on the death of, I, of Sarah and Abraham. Uh, but this morning we're looking at Genesis chapter 22, and I want to pray to ask God to help us to hear from him this morning. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would open our ears to hear, our minds to perceive, and our hearts so that we might receive what you have for us this morning. Now, we might not leave this place unchanged by the power of your word. May the Holy Spirit go ahead of me as I speak. May he change hearts and minds. And Father, make us all a little bit more like Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, famous for a few different reasons. Uh, he's known, of course, as a theologian, as a German theologian and pastor. Uh, some of you might know that he was also a co-conspirator in the attempt to assassinate Hitler. Uh, the story is really interesting. They tried multiple times. It got extremely close, uh, but it didn't succeed. You might also know that he was executed in a prison camp in Germany just before the end of the war. What you might not know is that he had the opportunity to avoid that unfortunate end to his life. Uh, during the 30s, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was part of what was called the Confessing Church. This was the true church in Germany that were fighting back against Hitler's attempts to co-opt the Christian church and to make it into a Nazi propaganda machine. And he was fighting against that. And throughout the 30s, he was becoming more and more un unpopular with the leaders of the country. And, and his friends in America said, you need to get out, Dietrich. Get out of Germany. Come to America. And so in June of 1939, he comes across to the United States. And almost as soon as he got there, he realized he'd made a terrible mistake. Sure, he could have stayed in America. He could have been safe for the dur duration of the war. He could have continued to write. But he believed that, that unless he went back to Germany and was with his brothers and sisters in their darkest hour, then he'd have no right to work with them after the war and restructure and rebuild the church. And so, also in June of 1939, he jumps on a boat, the last ship back to Germany. And of course, we know the rest of the story. That he ended up in prison and he ended up being executed. Now, was it a mistake to go back? I mean, he could have lived 
the rest of his life in peace. He could have enjoyed safety. Now safety in and of itself is not a bad thing. The Apostle Paul fled to safety on different occasions. A lot of us make safety a priority. It's a good thing. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer believed that he had to give up a good thing in order to serve the Lord. Bonhoeffer gave up his safety so that he could be with his brothers and sisters in their darkest hour. It makes sense that the man who wrote The Cost of Discipleship, which speaks about the costly sacrifices we need to make to obey Christ, couldn't avoid making a costly sacrifice himself. Brothers and sisters, today's passage is about the cost of discipleship. The passage teaches us that the faithful obey God even when it is costly. Now as a modern reader, it's easy to get distracted by the morality of what happens or even the psychology of the actors in what happens. But at its heart, it is about a man who does exactly what God tells him to do, even though it is costly, even though it doesn't on the surface make sense, simply because God told him to do it. He trusts the plan, he trusts in God, and he obeys. And yet, this this story raises a bunch of questions for us. And the first question is, God asked him to do what? Have a look again at verses 1 to 2. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, you're right. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now you might remember that the last chapter, chapter 21, is all about the fulfilment of God's promise. There was rejoicing. There was a feast. The child that Abraham and Sarah had hoped and prayed for for 20 years had finally come. Isaac was born. God is faithful. They were saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then this chapter, it's like a record scratch moment, isn't it? It's like, what? What do you want me to do, God? Now we're told up front that this is a test. It's one of the first words. Sometime later God tested Abraham. We're told as an audience reading this passage that this is a test from God. And so we know right off the bat that even if things look bad, they're not as bad as they seem. But Abraham doesn't know that. Abraham doesn't know that. All he knows is that God comes to him and says, You see that son that I promised to give you and I gave to you? Yeah, that son that you love, take him, kill him, and set him on fire on the mountain I will show you. And and you expect Abraham to say, What? What? We we expect Abraham to say something, but he doesn't. Instead, he gets immediately to work. Verse 3. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Instant and total obedience. Instant and total obedience. Uh, This is the best version of Abraham. This is what Abraham should have been doing the whole time. We've read his whole story. We've seen him stumble. We've seen him get it wrong. But not here. Not when he has been put to his hardest test. Now he is totally obedient. And verse 5 gives us a hint as to what's in his mind. He says in verse 5, we will come back to you. Meaning Isaac and himself. We don't see Abraham question the command at all. He doesn't stop to ask why God suddenly wants a human sacrifice. Or as someone mentioned to me, whether he's having some sort of psychotic break. Uh, Abraham is doing it because God told him to do it. And yet he appears to believe that both of them will return. 
Now, Abraham didn't have to say that. He could have just said, wait here until I return, or wait here for a while. But he said, wait here, and we will return to you. Now, the author to the Hebrews tells us that Abraham did this by faith, reasoning that since God had promised Isaac and given him to Abraham and Sarah, that God could raise Isaac even from the dead. Now, things get a little bit awkward in the story when Isaac notices that they don't have a sacrifice. Have a look at verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. God will provide, Abraham says. Again, a sign that Abraham is operating out of faith. I mean, it hardly even seems like the same man. The man that lied twice about his relationship with his wife. Is this the same man that that took Hagar as his concubine or as his wife because they didn't trust the Lord? Hardly seems like the same person. And yet, here we hit the the high point of the story in verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I mean, there just doesn't seem to be any hesitation, does there? I mean, I can't even imagine what this this scene was like. At this point, I imagine Isaac was not a willing participant. Horrible to even contemplate. And yet again, it's that modern inclination to look at this and think about Isaac's reaction, the psychological well being of Isaac, and to ignore Abraham's determination to obey the Lord. God did not normally ask for this kind of sacrifice, but child sacrifice was a well established and well known practice in the ancient world. Sure, God had explicitly promised this son and that um, that he would build a nation of people through this son. But God said, sacrifice the son you love. And Abraham obeyed the Lord. And then just as he reaches for the knife and is about to follow through, verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The angel called out to him. From heaven, it says. It was a shout from heaven. Abraham, stop! And the angel reveals that it was a test. And Abraham looked up, and just as Abraham had said, the Lord had provided a lamb for the slaughter, a ram stuck in the thicket. And God confirms the covenant with Abraham, once again promising to bless him, to make his descendants numerous, and through, all, through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed, because you obeyed me, the Lord says. Now the story is pretty straightforward. It's one that has interested Jewish and Christian commentators for the centuries, and yet it raises some pretty big questions. And the first of these questions is, does God put us to the test? Does God put us to the test? 
The answer, at least for Abraham, was yes. Verse 1 says it, doesn't it? Sometime later, God tested Abraham. And yet, this is hardly the only time that this happens. In Exodus, God tests his people at Marah. And again, uh, he tested them when the manna fell from heaven. In Deuteronomy 13, it says that if someone comes and says, let's worship other gods, that this is a test from the Lord to find out whether you love him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. The nations, according to Judges 2, were left in the land of Israel to test them and to see whether they would keep his ways. Hezekiah was tested by God to see what was in his heart. Proverbs 17 says, The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. 1 Peter 1 confirms that this isn't just something that happens in the Old Covenant. Let me read to you from 1 Peter 1. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. James speaks about it as well in chapter 1. But James makes a helpful distinction between a test from God and temptation. God does not tempt us to sin. He does not put a sinful desire in our hearts. God made me do it is not a valid excuse. James wants to make it clear that the blame for sin can never be put on God. But tests and trials definitely come out. And they do reveal what is in our hearts. During the California gold rush, uh, huge amounts of gold were discovered and traded. And yet not all yellow shiny metals are in fact gold. There is a common mineral called pyrite, which is also known as fool's gold and is completely worthless. And yet it can look very similar to the real thing. How can you tell? There were a few ways. But one was an acid test. Nitric acid is put somewhere on the material, and if it reacts, if it dissolves a little bit of the material, if it discolours or tarnishes it in any way, you know immediately that it is not gold. Gold doesn't react at all. It could be subjected to the acid, and it would not discolour, It would not tarnish and it would not dissolve. God does put us to the test. There will be some situation that has potential to be corrosive and it could reveal some base metal or mineral. But it is designed to reveal that our faith is genuine. The question is why does God need to do that? Uh, Did God not know what was in Abraham's heart from the beginning? Was God really sitting up in heaven going, I really wonder how Abraham's going to respond to this situation? God isn't awaiting the outcome of this test to know what Abraham had in his heart. No, the test not only reveals what is in our hearts to God, it reveals what is in our hearts to ourselves. Which is why even though trials may be uncomfortable, James tells us to count it as all joy when they come our way. Count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of various kinds. And you hear that and you go, James, like, have you ever been through a trial? But he's not saying count it as all joy because it's inherently joyful, because it's easy, because it's nice. He's saying count it as joy because you have to... We are by an effort of the will recategorize a trial as something to be joyful about. Because it produces good things in us. Tests reveal our character, but they also improve it. So yes, God will from time to time test us. Not quite as extreme as in the case of Abraham, but God is interested in seeing what is in our hearts. 
and in us seeing it too. The second question that this passage raises, what does God want us to do? What does God want us to do? Well, God has always and ever been after the same thing, our hearts. It's what he wanted from Adam and Eve in the garden. It's what he wanted from Israel in the wilderness. It's what Jesus wanted when he preached to hardened hearts in the Gospels. He wants the heart. He wants us to worship him, not just with external things, but with our whole lives. And so God comes to Abraham and says, Will you still worship me if I ask you to give up the thing that means most to you in the world? If you love me, sacrifice this precious son to me. And Abraham is willing because he does love the Lord. And God wants the same thing from us. He isn't satisfied with performance. Checking in with him once a week, fitting him around our other commitments. He isn't happy if we add religion onto a life that is not consecrated to him at all. The question this passage raises, and we all need to be challenged by, is are we willing to sacrifice the thing we love in order to be obedient to the Lord? Are we willing to set fire to the things that are precious to us Because they have captured our hearts. And God is not willing to share his glory with another. God is not obviously asking us to sacrifice our children. In fact, he did not even want that from Abraham. What he wants is wholehearted devotion. You see, the faithful obey God even when it is confusing and costly. The faithful obey God even when it is confusing and costly. God gets to make the rules. God sets the terms. If God wants us to live in a mud hut in the middle of the Algerian desert, then so be it. Now, some people have wondered about, you know, yeah, are there secret meanings behind the old covenant laws? You know, not boiling a kid goat in its mother's milk. I mean, surely that has some greater meaning. It probably does. It probably relates to some pagan practice. But it doesn't have to. God gets to tell us what to do. If he wants us to wear a little propeller hat on our head and spin it at least five times a day, if that's what God told us to do then that's what we do because we are his servants. Now fortunately God's not like that and unnecessarily cruel. Or weird. Although a little propeller hat sounds kind of fun. (laughs) God gets to set the rules. Now we talked last week about the Ishmael's. Do you remember that? We're talking about the Ishmael's. The Ishmael's are the things in our lives that will kill the promise if we keep them. They're the sins that we cling to, that never we never seem to completely send away. Or when we do send them away, we let them back in. If the Ishmael's are the bad things that we can't bear to send away but must, the Isaac's are the good things that we are tempted to love too much. The Isaac's are the things that we are tempted to love too much. They're the things that we cling to, that we might even be able to claim that God gave to us. They're a gift from God even. It's not wrong to love them. But it is possible to love them too much. It's it's a good thing from God. If it is a good thing from God, it is right that we love it, but not more than we love God. It is possible to love our jobs more than God. Even that job that was supernaturally provided, even that job where you feel like you are accomplishing your life's purpose, it can go from something that you are thankful for to something that you are thankful to. It can stop being a way that you serve the Lord to just being something you serve. It can go 
A gift, it can be a gift from the God that can take the place of the giver. It is possible to love family more than God. In fact, that's probably the one that happens the most frequently. They are good things. God has given us our families. He, he brought us together with our, with our spouses. He's given us the children that we have. You may have even got miracle children that you never thought you would have, but you'd have them. But they can take the place of God in our hearts. The church becomes a secondary consideration. And by this, I don't mean this building. I, I, I don't mean our services on a Sunday. I mean the people. Caring about people outside of our families doesn't even cross our minds. Calling up a single person to invite them for a minute meal doesn't happen because we're prioritizing our family stuff over everything else. We never fail to get to that soccer practice, but devotions at the dinner table, they're a hit and miss. Family is good. Godly men and women care for their families. In a godly set of priorities, our families will come above almost all other things, but not God. Now why is it like this? Why do even good things draw us away from the Lord? It's because we are born to worship. We are made to worship. We can't help but worship the things that we love. And the more we love something, the more we worship it. And the more we worship it, the more we love it. And the things we worship, the things that we love the most, if it is not God, then it will be something else. Jesus held nothing back from the Father. Jesus clung to no earthly comfort, or even heavenly comfort for that matter. He loved his mother, but not more than God. He loved his friends, but not more than God. He loved his life, but not more than God. And because of that, was willing to give it up for us. Abraham had no way of knowing what was being foreshadowed this day. When God said, I don't want you to sacrifice your son. Here, take this ram instead. God was basically saying, you don't have to do that, Abraham. You don't have to sacrifice your son, because I will. And whereas that ram was caught in the thicket against its will, Jesus willingly laid down his life for us. Nothing was too precious that it could take the place of God in his heart. He did not love his life under death. He did not love the things of this world so much that it would prevent him from doing what he was called to do. And now you might be thinking, well, that's easy because Jesus is literally God. Right? It was easy for Jesus to live a life that was fully devoted to his Father because he is God himself. But the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way. He had a loving family in his mother and siblings. He had a job as a carpenter. He had mates. But God came first. Jesus centered his earthly life around worship, around extended times of prayer, time alone with the Lord, time together with others, worshipping the Lord. And brothers and sisters, if we ask the Lord to become the centre of our lives, if we ask him for increasing levels of devotion, if we ask him to be the thing that we love most, Well, those things are dangerous to pray. Don't be surprised when God gives us the answer to those prayers. Because it might be costly. It might be uncomfortable for a season. But God wants our hearts. And the greatest possible joy will be ours when he has it. I wonder what would have happened if Bonhoeffer had stayed in the United States. I mean, it's possible, isn't it, that he would continue to live a long life. He would have seen um, the destruction and the rebuilding of his own country from afar. 
Maybe he would have kept writing. Maybe we'd have many more books with his name on it that we, have, that we enjoy today. It is just as possible that no one would ever remember he existed. He sacrificed his life, ultimately, for the love of his countrymen in order to see the gospel done and the gospel proclaimed in Germany. And because of that, we remember his name today. The faithful obey God even when it is confusing and costly. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we want to obey you. We want to serve you. And we don't do that perfectly. Um, in fact, we fail more often than we succeed, it seems. We want to obey you more. And we pray, Lord, that, um, that even those good things that take your place in our hearts, we would be willing to sacrifice and get rid of, if it means closer and greater devotion to you. Help us, Lord, because we imperfectly follow you. Help us, Lord, because our hearts are often crowded with other things. Help us, Lord, that we might love you with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our minds, and with all of our strength. In Jesus' name. Amen.